All right. Well, good afternoon. It's great to be up here with you. And man, it's hard to believe that it was 20 years ago when we were just sitting in that Roman spa, enjoying life with no worries, no concerns. It's two young guys. Um, but it's been such a blessing to see how the Lord has led us on and brought us to this place. If you go ahead and open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, this afternoon we're going to be talking and looking at the truth about love. The truth about love is that God loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son, that those who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And nothing can separate us from that love, not height, nor depth, nor length, nor width. Nothing can separate us from the love that God has for us. And that's such a joy to be able to talk about that this afternoon. And we're going to be addressing three truths about Christian love this afternoon. Now, this is probably one of the most well-known passages of Scripture in the Bible, a passage I'm sure you're all familiar with, a passage that many of you may even have memorized. Um, It's a favorite passage, and I doubt I'm going to be sharing anything new or profound with you, but it's my desire and my hope that I might stir you up by way of reminder of the realities of love, of the realities of God's love and its importance in our lives. And so in verse 1, we read, Paul writing to the church in Corinth says, "'Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels,' But have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so as I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself and is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked, and it thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this afternoon, and we thank you for this wonderful passage, Lord, that you've given to us in your word, Lord, so that we might know how to live, how to act in a manner that is pleasing to you as we, as your followers, as your disciples, live the way that you exemplified for us with love towards others, Lord. So, Lord, we pray that you'd bless our time, speak to us through your word, and by your spirit we ask and pray in your precious and holy name. Amen. Now, before we get into the passage here in in, in chapter 13, I want to back up and take a step back and look at the context really quickly in which Paul is writing this section of Scripture. In 1 Corinthians chapters 12 to 14, Paul is writing to the church, explaining the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives with the abilities and the gifts that he imparts so that we might minister effectively to others as the body of Christ. We are one body with many members who all have a role and a function to perform, working together and honoring one another. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, Uh, Chapter 12, verse 4, he says, There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Jumping down to verse 18, it says, God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. He composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And you may be wondering why we are looking at this. Well, 
That word care there is an important one, and it's, an imp- it's a powerful one. The word care there in the original language, in the Greek, it means to be anxiously worried and concerned. And in the context that we are to be anxiously worried and concerned for others. And this is important because this attitude of worry and concern for others sits at the very heart of what God's love is all about. Do we have anxious worry and concern for others? Maybe for our family, maybe for our children, maybe for our parents. Some friends might make the cut. But we are to have this concern and this care and this worry for other people. It sits at the very heart of what God's love is all about. And this is important, especially in the context of the body of Christ. For if we can't love one another with the care and the concern as we ought, how can we expect to effectively minister by the gifts of the Holy Spirit the love of Jesus to those others who are outside the church? And this really brings us to our first truth about Christian love. Christian love is others-centered. Christian love is others-centered. Nothing new or profound, but so very important. Christian love, God's love, is others-centered. 1 John 4, 7, 8, beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. I'm glad I learned that as a child through that wonderful song. Let us continue to teach that truth. Let us love one another for the love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And he who does not love does not know God because God is love. It's part of his very essence and nature. He is love. Romans 12.10 says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference putting others first, giving preference to one another. Philippians 2.3 says that we are to let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, we are to um, esteem others as better than ourselves. In fact, loving others is a command of Jesus. In John chapter 13, verse 34, he says, This new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Not only does he give us the command to love others, but he demonstrated how to do it. If you want to know how to act and how to love others, how to behave as a Christian, which Christian means just to be a little Christ, a follower, a disciple, an an imitator of Christ, Look to Jesus. He shows us through his very life how we are to love others. Now, when we talk about the love of God as described in the New Testament, it's, it's important that we have a clear understanding of what is meant by the love of God, what God's love is. Now, in the Greek language uh, in which the New Testament is written, there are four different words used to describe uh, love. Now, in the New Testament itself, there are only two words that are used. Uh, If you want to look and and, and read more about the four different loves, C.S. Lewis wrote a great book called uh, The Four Loves, and and he goes into and and expounds on those differences of love, and um, it's a good read. But in the New Testament, there are only two of these words used, the word phileo and the word agape, with agape being the more prevalent word used to describe God's love. And in this chapter, this is the word that he uses. And there are many ways in which these two ideas of love are contrasted, and we could spend all morning, uh, or really all afternoon now, contrasting these, Um, but I believe one of the main key differences between these two loves is that phileo love speaks of love that is born out of our emotions, it speaks of our affections, our desires, while agape love speaks out of love that is born out of the will a determinate, a determination, a choice. And that's one of the important differences between human love and God's love. Human love is, is based on emotions, affection, how we feel, where the love of God is based really 
out of the will, out of the choice, out of the purposing of our hearts and minds. If we were to give a working definition to love, it's hard to describe the love. I mean, we just sang that, you know, no one could write all of God's love with all the ink and all the parchment in the world. But hopefully we can understand a little bit. Christian love is a determined choice to sacrifice oneself for the welfare of another with that due care and concern that we talked about, and which does not require reciprocation or that the person being loved is deserving of love. And these things are important. Christian love is a determined choice. We choose to love. It's a determined choice to sacrifice oneself for the welfare of another. And when I mean sacrifice... It means that we lay down our wants, our desires. We lay down our time, our energy. We lay down even maybe our finances and our money. We lay down possibly even our lives like Jesus did. To sacrifice oneself for the welfare of another with due care and concern not expecting to receive any reciprocation, any reward back from our love, and loving others in a manner that they may not even be deserving of that love. Love despite those that we're loving, regardless of how good or how bad they are. F.B. Meyer said this. He said, love stands for that strong, sustained, and holy subordination of self for others which begins in will and act and is afterwards suffused by emotion. And I love that. When we choose to obey God and love others as we are called to, emotions will often follow. Affection will follow. Our our love isn't to just be dry and mundane. It follows. When we walk in obedience to God, in loving people, and sacrificing ourselves for the welfare of others with due care and concern, as we choose to do that, God will bless us oftentimes with that affection and that joy. And that's our reward, not from whoever we're loving, but from God. Christian love is other-centered. And Jesus' first teaching on love addresses this truth and also its extent. The first teaching, public teaching of Jesus on love was on love and its extent. In Matthew 5, verses 43 through 44, he says, You've heard it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And Jesus exemplified this for us throughout his life and ministry, but most significantly through his death on the cross, when he demonstrated his own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, while we were enemies of God, while we were in rebellion against him, he loved us. He loved us though we were undeserving. He loved us, though he would get no reward back, except for the joy that we are with him. He sacrificed himself for our benefit, for our welfare. Not out of affection, but out of a willing choice. And so love, the love of God, is others-centered That's the direction that God's love goes. It goes towards others. And it extends even to our enemies. We are to love our enemies the same way that we love our closest friends. The second truth about love is that Christian love is essential. Christian love is essential. It's necessary. It's a requirement, a prerequisite. However you want to term it, it is a must. It's a mandate. And this is what Paul addresses in the opening verses of 1 Corinthians 13 here. And it's essential in two ways. First, as it relates to us personally, but also second, in its relation to others. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, 
I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith. I've never met anybody like that. They could exist. So that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. And even if I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. And this was what Paul is addressing as it relates to us personally, but also in relation to others. Firstly, all these giftings and abilities that the Lord gives us through his spirit, Paul says are of no profit to us if they are not exercised in love. There's no honor or approval or esteem, no benefit or reward from God for the servant of God who does not have love as the motivation, as the disposition, and in the application of their service to others. If we don't use the gifts and the power that God has given us to love others, then it's worthless to us. It's our love which identifies us as followers of Christ, as Christians. And Jesus tells us that all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. In, first John, in, sorry, in John 13, 35. All will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. In 1 John, the, the Apostle John, in 1 John 3, 14, writes an interesting verse. He says that we know that we have passed from death to life because of our faith, because of God's grace. He writes that we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. Yes, we're saved by grace through faith alone. The way that we know that we've passed from death to life is because we love as God loves because we are loving as God is loving, as he births that new spirit in us that loves others. All the gifts, all the abilities of the Holy Spirit become of, of no effect, of no benefit, if we aren't loving people with them. Secondly, all these giftings and abilities that the Lord gives us through his spirit are greatly diminished and hindered in their effectiveness if you're not loving others. No eloquence of speech or ability to communicate is of much use without love. Our ability to encourage, to exhort, and to give comfort to others is rendered weak without love. How many times have you had somebody come up to you and give a word of encouragement, but you don't really know them, you don't really get any kind of love from them. You're like, okay, those are great words and thanks, but it doesn't really mean much. Eloquence of speech, ability to communicate without love just becomes noise because love is the vehicle through which the power of words is communicated. The power of our words is communicated through our love for them. If you love someone, and you share with them, and they understand your love in their heart, man, those become powerful words of God. No amount of revelation from God or faith in God will have much worth without love. You can have great biblical knowledge and understanding and have all the faith in the world, but without love, it's nothing. All that knowledge and understanding, all that faith become, is, is of little effect. To others without love. It's the difference of being a, a, a Pharisee and a disciple. The Pharisees, they had a lot of knowledge. You read through the, the, test, the New Testament, you read about the Pharisees, they had a lot of knowledge, or so they thought, but they had no love for the people. And they were ineffectual as leaders because of it. The disciples, they didn't know much. They were considered untrained and uneducated. Man, they had the love of God. And they served people, and they loved people, and they ministered effectively, and they flipped the world in the first century upside down. Caused problems for a lot of governments all over the world at that time because they loved. They loved God, and they wanted to share his love with others. And that's what makes Paul 
so powerful. He had both. He had knowledge and he had love. And he was used powerfully by God because of it. There's a reason that the Lord used him to write much of the New Testament. Finally, the third point that that Paul brings out about love here is that no amount of service or sacrifice will be of much profit if it's not done in love. Works without love become an obligation by the one giving it, which often results in resentment. Have you ever tried to go and do something for somebody when you just don't want to be there? It just becomes an obligation, and, and you resent having to be there. It happened recently to me. <laughs> I was like, oh, man, Saturday, I got to get up and go do this thing. I don't really want to go. I don't really know them. But I was like, okay, Lord, you're calling me to go down there. And I had a great time, great day, spending it with another brother, just doing some work, some showing Christian love. But that service and that work without love is, becomes an obligation, and it often results in resentment. While those that are on the receiving end of that kind of, of, of service wind up feeling like a burden and an annoyance, which often results in bitterness. Have you ever been on that side of the thing? Somebody comes and serves you, but grumpy, doing their thing, and like, thanks, see you later. And you're like, okay, like, this was horrible. Like, I'm not going to ask anybody to do anything ever again in my life if that's how I'm going to feel. They feel like a burden and an annoyance, which often results in bitterness. We need our, our love and our service and our sacrifice for others needs to be with love. Good works must be accompanied with love if we want our service and our sacrifice to be effectual. D.L. Moody, <laughs> he said, there's no use trying to do church work without love. A doctor, a lawyer may do good work without love, and often they do, But God's work cannot be done without love. It's essential. We must have love in our service, in our work for the Lord, in our speech, in our teaching. Love, Christian love, is essential. And that brings us to our third truth. That Christian love is a way of life empowered by the Holy Spirit. Christian love is a way of life empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, when we, people talk about a way of life, it can be an overwhelming idea and some ethereal you know, thing way up in the cloud, like way of life, like what does that even mean? Whoa, dude, that's cool. Way of life. A person's way of life is made up of all the small moments and everyday choices we make. How we live day to day through our conversation and our conduct will determine our way of life. Our way of life is a collection of the incidentals of our lives. And that's why the little things matter. The little conversations when you, that you have with your wife when things are so great. If you're anything like my family... Sunday mornings when you're trying to get out of the house and get to church and you're screaming at your kids, why aren't you ready yet? Those little moments make up our way of life. And if you look back and reflect and you think about all the little things in your life and the way that you speak to others, the way that you react, you think, oh, wow, my way of life doesn't look so good right now. Maybe I need to start changing those little things. Christian love needs to be a way of life expressed in all the little moments and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And in verses 4 to 7 of this chapter, Paul describes what Christian love looks like in his people, the way of life that they are to have, how they are to live. He says that love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself and is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It thinks no evil. 
It does not rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never fails. Our ministry will come to an end. The works of the Holy Spirit in our lives will end. When we get to heaven, when we're in the kingdom with him forever and ever, there won't be works. There won't be the power of the Holy Spirit to to minister in, in that same sense, but there will be love and there will be worship. Worship and love will exist throughout eternity. The gifts of the Spirit, our ministry to the world, those will end, but God, but the love of God will continue. In verse 13, he says, these will abide forever, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these things will remain forever. And so Paul describes what a Christian, what Christian love looks like in his people. As we read these verses, Understand that this is the expectation that God has for us day by day, moment by moment. In every interaction, this describes how we should behave. And as you read through this list, it becomes quickly evident that this is way beyond our ability as human beings to fulfill. I get to the first three and I'm like, okay, I'm done. (laughs) I'm walking away. Conviction. Stab me, kill me now. This kind of love, this kind of way of life is only possible through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit who gives us God's love so that we can work out his love to others it becomes quickly evident. It's way beyond our ability, but it describes Jesus perfectly. I love that. Again, if you want to uh, cause yourself some self-harm, go ahead and stick your name in there and read through it and see how uh, how you come up. And that's important because this is the standard. This is the expectation of God on how we are to behave, how we are to live. Now, we don't have time to go through all of these descriptions, but I want to highlight a few important ones, especially in our culture today. The first one, love suffers long and is kind. It speaks of enduring harm and hurt from others and responding with kindness. Anybody here like to... Just enjoy being hurt and harmed by the things that people say and do to you. We're to be long-suffering. We are to endure those things. He says that we are to suffer long under the barrage of the arrows and the bullets that people throw at us. Not only that, but it says that it responds with kindness. Throughout the New Testament, we see over and over that we are to love our enemies. Paul writes that if we love our enemies, we heap heaping coals on their heads, right? (laughs) You want to do harm to your enemy? Try being kind to them instead. See how it'll light their head on fire. Love suffers long and is kind. We need to respond with kindness from the hurt and the harm that we receive from others. That's what Jesus did. We see that throughout his life. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter even. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Peter, he comes to Jesus and he asks, How many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? Perfect number, right God? Seven times? Number of completion. Jesus said, no, Peter, you got it wrong. There's no end to your forgiveness and to your kindness towards others. I don't say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. Don't even bother doing the math, Peter. Just unending forgiveness, unending 
kindness, as you forgive, as you respond with that kindness. After all, it was the kindness of God that led us to repentance. And it's our kindness that will help lead others to Jesus. We need to be kind, especially in a culture which is so consumed with being unkind, verbally abusive, attacking, always attacking. Our our culture, our society is so divided right now. You only have to turn on the news for a split second to see the animosity and the anger and the unkindness between people with differing views and opinions. People respond so unkindly in our day and age, and we need to be different. We need to be responding to others with kindness. Love thinks no evil. Some of your translations may say it keeps no record of wrongs, and really that's the more literal meaning, that love does not keep a record of wrongs. How many of you got lists in the back of your Bible? Uh Uh-huh. That guy, Joe, yeah, he's in trouble. Yeah, oh yeah, that that girl, Haley, Uh uh-huh. Troublemakers, got to watch out for them. Recompense. Vengeance. You have conversations and you have disagreements with your wife, your spouse, and sometimes those disagreements come up years later. You still remember that? Yeah, I remember that. Are you kidding me? I'm never going to forget that. Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. It doesn't hold grudges. It doesn't seek retribution. After all, that's the reason we really keep lists, keep a record, isn't it? So that we can hold a grudge. So that we can bring some uh, retribution at some point. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. You know, when we came to the, the Lord, when we placed our faith in Christ, you know what God did? He took our big list of record of wrongs and he poured ink all over it and said, can't see it anymore. It's all rubbish. He blotted out our transgressions. He washed it all away. Not able to be seen or remembered any longer. As far as the east is from the west, he removed our transgressions from us. And we need to be acting in the same way. From the hurt and the harm that we receive from others. Just blot it out. Get rid of it. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. And we've heard some great messages this morning on that. Love does not rejoice in sin. Love does not approve of. It does not tolerate. It does not rejoice in sin. Our culture does. Society demands that we do. But love, the love of God, does not approve, does not tolerate, does not rejoice in the sin that is being expressed today. But it does rejoice and it is made glad by all that is true. Love loves truth. Love loves truth. God loves truth. And we need to be people who love truth. And again, as as Pastor Gary rightly said, God is our plumb line for what is true. He's where we go to find what's right and true. And he reveals truth to us. Truth is noble and it is absolute. And love, those who have the love of God, love that which is true. If love is concerned with the well-being of others, and it is, then love will speak truth to others. Love will walk in truth. Love will reveal truth. In Ephesians 4.15, we're commanded that we are to speak truth with love. We need to speak truth with love. 
And these things need to be united. I think it was uh, Warren Wearsby who said that love, sorry, that truth without love is brutality. But love without truth is hypocrisy. We need to have love and truth. We need to be speaking the truth in love. We need to be standing for truth in love. Love will declare and fight for what is true so that others may not be deceived and suffer the consequences of believing a lie which could prove fatal to them, fatal for their lives, fatal for their souls. Aaron reminded us of that. We need to be unashamed of the gospel. Be confident in the truth that God has revealed and speak it forth because it is the power of God unto salvation. We need to be standing and fighting for truth, but we need to be doing it in love. We don't want to be brutal people. I know some brutal people. You go out on the street and you hear some of the street preachers out there. They're brutal. They speak in truth, absolutely. But they don't have any love or grace for people. And that's not attractive. That's not going to attract people to Jesus. Jesus spoke truth, but he did it with love. 2 Thessalonians 2.10 says, Those who perish, they perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Truth is so important, but it needs to be mixed and mingled and united with love. And finally, love bears, believes, hopes, and endures all things. Not just some things, but all things. The word bears here holds the idea of protection, to put a roof over, to cover over, specifically in the sense of keeping confidence. Love bears, it covers over all things, it keeps confidence in all things. It doesn't reveal the sins or the shortcomings of others. It protects. It doesn't gossip. It doesn't speak bad of others. It's tight-lipped. And Peter, he talks about the same thing in 1 Peter 4.8 when he says that love covers a multitude of sins. Love always seeks to believe the best of people's intentions and actions. It's always hopeful for a positive outcome, earnestly desiring that all things would work out for the best. And it endures every difficulty and hardship that comes our way, whether relationally or situationally. In 1 Corinthians 16, 14, at the end of his letter to the Corinthians, he says, let all that you, be, all that you do be done with love. Now, in closing, I want to quickly address two untruths about love that our culture and society are pushing and which we need to be careful of because they are creeping into the church. And the first is this idea of self-love. How many of you heard that? Self-love, the importance of self-love. For those of you in the, in the working, uh, in work, you probably went through some uh, workshop or seminar about the idea of practicing self-love, of having concern for your well-being. Self-love is the practice and appreciating and valuing oneself. It's the practice of appreciating and valuing oneself, teaching that it's essential for our well-being, physically, psychologically, and even spiritually, to practice and appreciate and value yourself. And it all sounds good on the outside, but it's really just dressing up and justifying a self-centered mindset. And there's nothing good that can come from that. This stands in direct contrast to the biblical mandate to be others-centered. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come up, come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In Galatians 5, 24, Paul writes, those who are Christ have crucified, put to death the flesh with its passions and its desires. Paul himself considered himself the least of the apostles, the chiefest of sinners, and he considered everything that he could boast in about himself as being worthless. 
saying that nothing good dwelt in him. This idea of self-love is dangerous because it produces a self-centeredness, which is never good in our way of life. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be mindful of our well-being. We do need to take care of ourselves. But self-love isn't the way in which we do that. Jesus, whenever he was spent and in need, what did he do? He separated himself to pray, to be with his Father. He sought out his heavenly Father. The best way to take care of ourselves and our our well-being is not through self-love, but it's to come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need, as we're told in Hebrews 4.16. You need some self-love? Go to Jesus. Go to God. Spend some time in prayer. Spend some time reading your word. That's how we take care of ourselves, family. Not through this idea of appreciating, practicing self-appreciation, self-value, speaking well of ourselves. Oh, how good I am. I can do it. I'm so strong and powerful. I can get up here and give a good message. No, it's not about self. It's about him who gives us what we need. The second is the ideology of purging toxic people. How many of you have seen social media stuff where people say, it's time to clean out my friends list and get rid of people who are toxic and harmful to my life. It's this idea that we need to cut off and end relationships with those who disagree with us or who exhibit behaviors and traits that are seen as detrimental to our well-being because they cause stress, negativity, or comfort in our lives. We got to cut off toxic people because they're no good for me. They cause too much stress, too much anxiety, too many problems. i got to get rid of these people out of my life. got to cut them off, end these relationships that are just dragging me down. And I've seen many Christians on social media espousing this ideology that is so anti-biblical, so anti-love of God. This is not walking in love as we're commanded. It's not seeking the well-being and benefit of of others. It's self-seeking and it's self-serving. Jesus calls us to be salt in this world. And salt preserves. It brings healing and it purifies. We may not need toxic people in our lives, but they need us. They need us to be that purifying, healing influence in their lives. That's why we don't cut people off. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be wary and of and perhaps distance ourselves from certain individuals who are abusive and are specifically seeking to do us harm, that's a different issue. And we're not going to talk about that today. But those who have these character traits, views or opinions that are troublesome, we need to love them, and they need the love of Jesus. And we are to be that love for them. And so let us walk in love as the Lord commanded us, understanding that Christian love is other-centered, That Christian love is essential to our lives. God has commanded it. And that Christian love is a way of life that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And let us beware of these ideologies of self-love and the purging of toxic people which are contrary to biblical Christian love. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord for your word and the things that you've reminded us of. Lord, may we be stirred up to love others as we ought, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you loved us so much that you gave us your son, Lord. And we pray that we would walk in that same manner of love towards others, Lord. That we would willingly, that we would determine to willingly lay down our lives for the well-being of others, giving them that due care and concern, understanding, Lord, that it may not be reciprocated and understanding that they may not be deserving. But that's how you loved us, Lord. And we want to love others the way that you showed us, the way that you taught us, the way that you commanded us, Lord. So help us to walk in love as we ought. In your precious and holy name.
Amen. Amen. God bless you.